came back to Perth for the second time around, which was in 94, I switched fields and started on the journey of learning in the first instance geostatistics. And uh, then a little bit later on, actually, in fact, quite a bit later on, sort of around the 2010s, I started to turn my attention towards compositional geostatistics or compositional data analysis more generally. And the reason for that was that if you're working in mining data sets, you're often actually looking at multivariate data sets. Uh, the data typically are constrained, uh, typically constrained to add to 100%. Not that uh, the variables necessarily add to all of that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, it's, a, it's a slightly... So, it, it, to, so to some extent, one needs to take that, that aspect into account. And on top of it all, of course, the data are positive. So you've got positive constraint data. And if they're then multi, if, if you then have multiple variables, as you tend to do, you somehow or other need to treat these data as an ensemble, as, as one entity, rather than treating the variables as separate independent variables. And so, hence, compositional geostatistics. So I want to briefly talk about the outline of my talk. I will very briefly talk about the definition of compositional data and then move into uh, the way they're normally treated, look at uh, statistics in log ratio space, move towards geostats more generally, and then look at some practical aspects. And if time permits, I've got a second little case study with me that deals with a somewhat larger data set than the one I'm using to illustrate the concepts here. So compositional data are essentially uh, data that are bounded above and below, uh, below typically by zero, above by some constant. That constant kappa could be a hundred thousand, well, a million parts per, it could be a hundred percent, they could be one, they could be almost anything. It depends on the context as to what is really used. Uh, in our case, we're looking at not only compositional data, but in addition to that, they're regionalized. In other words, they are, de are location-dependent. And this is why in my case, I've got an index U sub alpha here, indicating uh, the region in space. Space may well be two-dimensional or three-dimensional or every now and again even one-dimensional. Uh, that's in, in mining sets very rare, but otherwise uh, can happen. And um, the set of all of the D vectors that you get in that form, D being the number of different components. So you might be might be envisaging something like, say, in an iron ore data set, which is the kind of data set I'll be using here. You might be looking at uh, iron itself as one of the variables, alumina, silica, uh, possibly manganese, possibly phosphorus, possibly chlorine, and a whole lot more. Uh, but you could also be looking at something completely different. It just depends on the context. One of the issues that arises is, of course, is the fact that because of, cl uh, because of the fact that the data are closed, we get into artificial um, behavior as far as the variables go. For example, you could get negative um, correlations that are entirely meaningless in the context, uh, but exist because of closure. Uh, often, for example, you see that in the case of Again, looking at iron ore, if you have an iron ore deposit, you might easily have iron being negatively related to alumina and to silica. It's a very common thing. And, it's an, and on top of it all, you see fairly sharp lines, and I'll show you that in a minute. So because of that, uh, quite a few people uh, decided that in the long run, it might not be feasible to treat these data in constraint space but rather go ahead and uh, add, don't and analyze them in a different fashion. So they're not analyzed raw, but in a transformed setting. And the reason for that uh, is because of uh, cross variograms showing these neg the negative bias and these various correlations. But more importantly, because of closure, the co-creating co systems are typically, which are used in order to infer uh, 
uh, values at ensemble locations, they're typically singular. And that comes about because the covariance matrix itself uh, and the and the regional and the covariogram are singular. And in addition to that, because coke rigging is actually not a convex estimator, you run into the situation that your co-simulated values or your coke rigged values might not be positive. They could end up being negative, although we have a positivity constant, although our data are positive and they might not end up summing to 100%. And all of that is problematic, which is why one should be treating the data in raw space. So there are several, so how is that typically achieved? And that um, these transformations were first introduced by Aitchison in the 80s. Uh, there are several so-called log ratio transformations. The reason for log ratio transformations is that while ratios would have opened up uh, the simplex to the positive half hyperspace in d minus one in d dimensions. Uh, they will not would not have gone. They would they do not allow for negative values. So that's where the log comes in. And so typically uh, you treat these data in terms of log ratios. There are different versions of log ratio transformations. On the one hand side, you have the so called additive log ratio transform where typically the last component of your vector of your vector value data is used as a divisor. So you take each of the individual other components and divide by the last component and then take the log. That's what that uh, somewhat weird notation means. The minus D just stands for the fact drop the last component and then divide each other component by ZD, which is the last component. Uh, another version is the centered log ratio. Uh, so, but going back to the ALR briefly, the ALR goes from uh, the sim d dimensional simplex to d, dimen d minus one dimensional real space. So we move from here down to there. The CLR transform stays in d dimensional place because all you're doing here is you're dividing by the, geom uh, the geometric mean. The disadvantage of that is that the, covar uh, that the covariance matrices still turn out being singular, so they're still, uh, because they're still uh, the addition to zero. And in 2003, uh, further transformation was added to that family called the intrinsic log ratio transform. Mathematically, that's the most, ele most, most elegant if you don't care about the application. Um, and in that case, you basically have a transformation that says uh, your transformed data are V times log Z. And V is a D minus one by D matrix that is almost an orthogonal matrix, but not quite. <laughs> I say almost orthogonal because it's actually not a square matrix. So all of these are available. And then in addition to that, the so-called pairwise log ratio transform, where you just look at all pair, possible pairs of variables um, and take, their log, take the log ratio, take the log of their ratios. So whole family of um, transformations that could be used. They are interrelated and that is actually a very nice feature. You can move basically from ALR to CLR and ILR and back again. Um, the matrix J is um, that you're using to move to actually write the ILR. The ALR is just I, I D minus uh, D minus one by D minus one identity matrix followed by a negative, a vector of negative ones. Um, the matrix H, uh, that is um, also quite nice. That's um, also an identity matrix, but in d-dimensional place space and then transformed by subtracting um, a matrix of ones, one, one on D times ones. And we've also got uh, similar things for the ILR. <coughs> but just very briefly, um, so that's, first of all, the, the various uh, relationships. 
And here you see that, and I forgot to talk about that last line. In that last line, you see how they are related. Ya, so the ALR transform can be written as J times the, the standard log ratio and can also be written as J V transpose times the um, intrinsic log ratio transform data and so on. So you can move between them. The data set I'm going to use is um, a data set which I laid my hands on in about 2013 when I convinced the master student to actually try these techniques out in a mining setting. And um, that data set is, an, is a data set from an iron ore deposit. The iron ore deposit is located in Kulyanobing. Uh, for those of you who don't know where that is, you know where Kulyanobing is? Ah. Well, Kalgoorlie is about here. Kulia Nobeng is uh, along the east, uh, is just north of the Great Eastern Highway at about Southern Crossway. So about 450 k's inland from Perth and uh, it's a very rich deposit. It's mined out by now. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the geology in detail because I actually don't quite get geology in that sense all that well. But the important thing is that uh, there are three types of ore. The ore that is of importance here is the hard ore, which is very iron rich. And that is contained in the pink, the um, yellow, and then there is another domain, domain number 300, which is the blue domain here on the side. That's the areas where this particular ore exists within the confines of the ore body. And one of the objectives here was to try and actually model that data set. So just to give you a bit more of an insight into what that looks like, uh, here we've got the various drill, drill cores. This is colored in gray by um, al alumina at the moment. Here you see in contrast the coloring by iron and what you see quite clearly is that ne negative relationship that in part comes about because of uh, closure. The reason why I say a negative relationship coming about by closure is because you really don't know what geochemical processes might be driving this. And so while we're seeing a numerical relationship, it may not have any inherent meaning from a geological perspective. And this is just the set of, po of points we have for the case of um, the deposit we're looking at and for the constraint I introduced by selecting particular domains. So if you look at these data in raw space and we're using five different variables here um, and the reason for their choice was that iron is the main variable. Um, silica and alumina typically impact adversely the saleability of the product, so they need to be modeled simply need to be modeled in part in order to ensure that the quality of the ore you're getting is correct and is usable for whoever wishes to mine it, uh, wishes to process it. It's got to do with uh, the furnaces and uh, detrimental features in the furnaces, but then manganese and Phosphor also need to, need to be controlled for. If you look at the raw data and the basics, very basic raw statistics, you see that uh, there are quite an, an order of magnitude difference between the variables and also quite considerable skewnesses. You further see here in the scatter diagram when you look at the raw data quite clearly these, the effect of the constraints, for example, in alumina versus iron, or also uh, in silica versus iron, somewhere where have we got that here, here's uh, in that particular scatter diagram, you see that constraint quite clearly. Um, you see similar features when you look at silica versus alumina and so on. So, as I said, uh, these data are transformed in order to treat them. And uh, because of the fact that it might make sense to retain a little bit of the interpretation, it is quite common to use the ALR transform in a mining context if you use um, geo uh, compositional data analysis at all. Um, 
And so what is done here, because the elements do not represent all the possible elements that could be, could be contributing to the 100%, uh, one typically introduces what is called a rest variable to capture the fact that we haven't analyzed for chlorine, that we haven't analyzed, that there might be OH minus or other variables that would need to be accounted for and that aren't accounted for. Uh, what you see when you carry out the transformation, you see in the first instance that uh, the, the diagrams become a bit better readable. <laughs> in a way, because you uh, you see more as to in the density plots than you see in the raw density plots. You can much more easily see the, the distribution and relationships between the log ratios. Um, a typical part of the interpretation would be to look at the, stati the raw statistics, the, the statistics in transformed space as well. And so here, what we're looking at is actually the geometric mean and we're looking at the, vari the variation matrix, the variance of the log of the ratios between pairs of elements. And that is why you see a main diagonal of zeros in that red part, which gives us a variation matrix, which tells you at the same time that you've got a problem with positive definiteness here as well. And in fact, I mean, you've got a, a mate, that variation matrix is actually negative semi-definite typically. Anyway, so transform the data. The data have also de-skewed quite a bit. You can see that uh, in the histograms at the bottom, the transformed data have a much nicer shape. There's no, uh, no histogram for rest here. We've only got the other five variables. I noticed you counting, John. <laughs> And uh, so, so it, it, the data set starts to become a bit nicer in a way. So then what does geocompositional geostats actually really do? The basic idea is to apply geostatistical methods to these transformed data. So you transform your data, you carry out variography, uh, variography being one of the most essential points in the whole exercise. And then you either perform multivariate estimation, typically via Kriging or co-Kriging in that sense, in that case, and likewise multivariate simulation. And then once you've done whatever you needed to do, whether it's estimation or simulation, you back transform. And we'll see how that goes. So first, very quickly, uh, some words about uh, variograms. So variograms basically look at uh, the variability of a variable at, uh, or at the same variable actually uh, separated by a particular distance. It's a bit like a, a correlogram uh, in, in the time series sense, except this time we're dealing with space. And so what we see here is essentially that in this variogram, which is a variance of z at x plus h minus zx. So you're working out the value over all, all values, all locations x or all locations u. The variogram increases with distance until it hopefully levels out, at which point you, inter you basically interpret uh, the behavior as being no spatial autocorrelation left. The distance at which this spatial autocorrelation ceases to exist is known as the uh, range. And the level at which the variogram levels out is known as the sill. Uh, there are instances where you have an unbounded variogram um, that either suggests that you haven't domained the data properly or that you might need to use a different estimator which case you typically remove a trend and then having removed a trend, you work with the residuals. The um, pink line at the bottom, uh, likewise, is the cross variogram. So that looks at the um, variability between pairs of variables separated by distance h. Uh, 
And on the left, we see the formulation for the classical case, which is the case where you're looking at variables that are untransformed. Now, we, try, we use these with uh, log ratio transformed data. So the definition is exactly the same, except that instead of Z, you would have the ALR, the ILR, or the CLR transform. Or you could, of course, go all the way and use the variation variogram, which is the definition at the bottom. Because of the fact that they are interrelated and that we have these transformations that allow you to move from one to the other, it doesn't actually matter which one you use. They're all just a different representation of the same uh, object. So then we fit a model. The critical thing will be that when you model multivariate data, you're a little bit constrained as to what models are allowable. And the uh, constraint comes about by the fact that you want your overall uh, model of the co-regionalization, as one says, to be positive definite. And that means that one typically controls for the sake of simplicity, the SIL matrices. And that means that uh, one of the basic principles being that you would not ever use um, a new model structure in a covario in a cross variogram that hasn't appeared already in the main in the direct variogram. That's just one of the constraining principles one uses to guarantee that the estimator is fine in the end. And there are a whole lot of different functions you can fit, like you can use Matan functions, you can use whatever. But again, even as since the, the variables themselves are related, so are the, the uh, variograms. And so you can move from ILR to CLR. You can move from CLR to ILR, from CLR to ALR, and so on. And this is essentially shown in that diagram. And that basically gives you the way in which you would transform from one to the other. So for the sake of the argument, you could say to yourself, okay, I like working with the ALR best because it, it has meaning for me. So I'll model the ALR variograms. And then in order to check that my model is reasonably okay, I transform and I look at what happens to the others. And that's what we did in this particular instance. And <laughs> so here are my also beautiful variograms. What you see is because our data set was, three was uh, such that space was three-dimensional, we've got um, variability in the plane and of course also downhole in the Z direction. Um, the light blue ones, so first of all, these variograms are the downhole var direct variograms for the variables. The blue, uh, the black and blue are the variograms in the plane for the main for the main variables on themselves, and the remaining variograms are cross variograms. So here, for example, we have the cross variogram for uh, alumina and iron in ALR space. And you see there's a negative relationship there. Here you have um, iron and manganese. And if you look carefully, you see that they are actually mimicked in the downhole. So you have consistency there. And in order to get a reasonably good fit, we needed some this is me and my co-author co on that particular paper, we needed some force structure. One day describing the very short scale structure and then several other fun spherical functions. Spherical, fu spherical variograms are cubic functions essentially. Uh, one being isotropic. So in other words, the variability was the same in all directions. The other two had an isotropy. So we had varying behavior depending on the direction in the plane. Now, if we apply the same models to the variation variograms, uh, you see that you get a very good fit for them as well. 
And similarly for the um, centered log ratios, the fact that the uh, cross variograms aren't always that wonderful, like here, for example, that's partly a scale effect because we're actually only looking at 0 to 0 0.04 uh, compared to much larger ranges for the main variograms. So, as you see, I mean, what that basically tells us is simply that the various um, representations are reasonably consistent and we can move on with them. So then point support coda co-craging. So that then proceeds as follows. We've done the first step. We've transformed the data. We've gone to the step of actually uh, estimating variograms. We fitted models. Um, we're now at the spot where we would be co-craging the log ratio scores based on the models we fitted, and then we can back transform. Um, just as in other areas, uh, you would do a cross-validation first, and you can either use leave one out or enfold as you prefer. Basically, the way that is done in this setting is you remove, at, you re-estimate values at a particular location, removing the entire vector at that location so that you don't get uh, a preferential variable. You do that for the entire subset and the entire set and you have your um, estimates. You can then compare these estimates to the true values. and in this case, one comparator you can use, I mean, that's the other complication that immediately arises. We're dealing with multivariate data. You cannot, you, it doesn't, you can't just use the distance between one element and its estimate. You need to use the um, vector as a whole. So you have problem, so there's no ordering left. <laughs> so again, that means we need, we can only work with distances here, not with, um, errors in raw space quite the same way. And so we use an, the H's and Mahala Nobis distance in this instance. So this is a distance that is based on the log ratios and the matrix sigma inverse here, that is actually the inverse matrix of the co craging estimation variances. So that, that you get from a vectorial formulation of co craging In this particular instance, having used my da the data we just saw, um, you see on the left, the scatter diagram between the log ratio estimates and the errors. Uh, on the upper diagonal, we've got the estimates and the um, true values. Um, get correlations of around what, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 at times that's considered good enough for that purpose. And you can also look at trying to see whether or not your uh, distances provide a reasonable fit. And the comparator in this case is the Mahalonobis, is, is the chi-square distribution. We had six variables, so we need five degrees of freedom. And if we wanted to work out deviation ratios or anything of that type, there are two versions. The first version, deals with the entire vector and its um, and the co-craging yet again. The uh, second one only with the main um, square errors. Main errors being the errors between the estimates of the variables themselves and not taking account of uh, the relationships between the variables. So if you're really interested in the full in the full error, the first one is the one to be used. And then you can of course back transform, see what that does. And finally, um, you would say, okay, so we've got our estimates, so that's all good. But the trouble of course is that uh, these estimates are at point support. Now, if you think about the fact that we are mining, mm -hmm. or rather that this is a mining application, point support doesn't do anybody any good. 
Uh, so we need to upscale and again because of the log ratio and that's why this method was for a long time actually criticized quite a bit just like log, uh, log normal Krieging for example which uh, which was a very early method for say for example estimation in gold in particular um, but the reason why uh, that was then uh, criticized is because they were people were getting concerned about introducing bias because of the nonlinear transform, and that was typically caused by incorrect treatment, namely back transformation without correcting and without uh, and 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 not observing the fact or noting the fact that you can't just average across nonlinear <laughs> entities. So here we have two different possibilities of moving forward on that. You can, on the one hand side, use uh, quadrature and uh, weight your points differently. Um, there's a book by Vera Pavlovsky from the 90s where she illustrated that. It is rather tedious because you need the full Krieging matrices at every location and that's a bit painful. Or you can uh, say, all right, I'm not going to worry about co-Krieging. I'm going to go straight to simulation. And uh, then you can, uh, of course, upscale your point, your point data directly. And again, some things to be taken into account. Um, and I need to start with what's general practice in geostats. What's happening in geostats typically is that uh, people go ahead and say, okay, I've got five variables and I need to model them jointly, but they aren't normally distributed. My algorithms are normally uh, so that they're optimal for normally distributed data. So what do I do? And what they do in general, and that's still the case, they take each variable individually, transform it via a quantile matching. Uh, so they match the quantiles of the distribution of their raw data they have with the normal distribution one at a time and use that. And um, don't account for any relationships between data. So the result is that the data, the transformed data, the transformed data might be marginally normal, but not multivariate normal. Um, in the last 15 years, there has been a bit of work on trying to remedy that. But I mean, one of the problems that arises is that the data sets are quite large. And if you have a lot of variables, even if the data sets are large, you don't have enough data. So as for example, a step, stepwise approach that has been used quite a bit. Um, so you choose a main variable, you normalize that, you normalize the next one conditionally on the first and then. And, and. So you run out of data pretty quickly. Um, and the other approach is, um, that is used is um, projection pursuit. The latest one I've seen is that you normalize the data using uh, PCA and these, these individual um, quantile matchings I was talking about. So do a quantile matching, then run a PCA, take the transformed data, um, so P quantile match PCA, quantile match them again, run a PCA and iterate that uh, until you get something that's multivariate normal. There's a paper which, is, which was done by some people in Google and that seemed to have worked quite successfully and there's some people, uh, local consultants that actually use that method. Uh, but it's not quite clear what its properties are. And um, so what, so what, so a few years ago, we thought about this, uh, we thought about what on earth are we going to do about this? And um, a colleague of mine, Gerald van den Bogart, who was at uh, the HIF in Freiburg, came up with a neat idea that seems to work quite well, but it's a bit slow, but that's okay. <laughs> it only takes a day or so on the back transform. And so what we do is we uh, use a, a, a transformation that's used on, on, on a flow. So in other words, we try and pull our data towards sphericity. And as far, and so what happens is here in this particular process, procedure, 
you, I, you check your data and see whether or not your multivariate normality assumption is, is reasonably satisfied. If it is, then you don't worry about transformation. Otherwise, you use a, you use a transformation. And if you do so, you need two back transforms, obviously, and see how you go. So how does that transform work? Well, the way it works, you might have data that look like so. You pull them towards the center by taking each point and solving a differential equation as if you were in a, in a, in a, in a real flow. So in other words, take, take examples from, hy from hydro hydrology, essentially. You get to a situation where your data are almost normal and hopefully pair, pairwise normal in this instance. Then once you reach that stage, you simulate. That's at this point, and then you back transform. And there's a paper on that in mathematical geosciences that explains the mathematics for that. Uh, but it's essentially looking at a differential equation and solving that differential equation over and over and over again. So in the case of our data, you might recall earlier on, we started out with uh, an ALR space with this particular set of scatter diagrams. So after running the flow anamorphosis, we ended up with data that were almost normal, normal enough for our purposes. And then the other nice thing that happened in the process, and that is an artifact that comes about, I think, because uh, part of the steps are using principal component analysis, you also get decorrelation. And so you can model your variables separately. You don't need to model them jointly any longer, which speeds up um, simulation a lot in our case. And um, so having um, then mo modeled and simulated these data. And here are the models in this instance are much nicer and much smoother and much more easy to interpret. We can simulate and then look at some output. So if you look back to what we had originally, this is, uh, these are two realizations. This here, the top is a realization of iron in raw space. This here is the expected value over 100 simulations. And here we can also look at ratios of, uh, expect of uh, various variables and their logs to see how they relate and how they compare to the inputs. Now, as far as comments go, one of the reasons why we put this particular workflow together is to actually demonstrate that it's practical to use. And um, it's particularly relevant if really you cannot just model the main variable of interest. Like if you need to know not only iron, but also the values for silica and whatever else at unsampled locations, then an approach like uh, compositional geostats is definitely practical and useful. Um, you don't need to separate out major elements and trace elements, which can be advantageous. Um, and the other thing is you have independence of choice of representation. And because of the fact that we have transformed the data, opened up the space and then back transformed, we automatically get positivity and total sum constraints on it. Uh, We've also noted that often we have better reproduction of the raw correlations, which geologists will look at in order to see whether or not this makes sense or whether we've, you know, produced complete crap. And uh, finally, we can uh, also sometimes use specific types of variables to exploit natural relationships. I mean, there are other versions where you use what is called an amalgamation, which might be uh, more complex uh, chemical compounds that get used. But on the other hand, uh, there are also, of course, like always downsides. One of them is uh, the need for isotopy. In other words, we need to know the values of every variable at each location. 
that is in our sample set. Um, that's not necessarily always given because you might have data that come from different sampling campaigns or you might have uh, issues with uh, detection limits. There are imputation methods that can be used to try and address that, that are compositionally compliant. There's a whole group of people working on that aspect in the, at the Technical University in Vienna and some people in Olmutz. Um, the other problem, as always, is the inference of a, of a valid variogram that is always tedious. Not impossible, but it might be very hard to get something reasonable there. And of course, I mean, you still need transformations in simulation. And finally, your log ratio transformation is, is not linear. And so you need to be careful with how you post-process. But overall, um, so far, we have found that the, this particular procedure actually works quite well and produces results that are credible. And yeah, so that's essentially case study one done. And I can stop here or I can go on. <laughs> okay, I'll go on a bit. So first of all, here is a, a workflow. That workflow basically just summarizes what needs to be done in order to get to, uh, to a nice geostatistical uh, result in the end. I'm not going to talk about that, but essentially you have five steps. Data, empirical variograms, variograms, and output. And you either move this way or this way, or you go all the way down to your simulation models. But the second case study I very quickly wanted to produce is something completely different and um, the data set is much larger. So in this instance, um, you're looking at a map of Australia, as you can see, and you see all of these little dots. These are sample locations across, the, uh, across Australia taken at a resolution of one site every 5,200 <laughs> square kilometers. Um, and it's a geochemical uh, soil survey that was conducted to try and get some background information about, uh, about the elemental distribution across Australia. It was conducted from 2007 to 2009. There are a whole lot of countries that do uh, surveys of that type. If you want a really good data set, uh, look at Northern Ireland. They have a, a resolution of one sample per two and a half square kilometers which basically almost doesn't need any mapping, any, any, any interpolation any longer, it's so dense. Um, what they did is they sampled, um, for each sample, they took two subsamples, two soil horizons, a top soil and a, and a bottom soil, and also two um, grain size fractions. So they have a coarse grain fraction and a, and a finer grain fraction. And they have elemental concentrations for 60 elements. Of these 60 elements, this particular study actually ended up using 50. The reason why the others were thrown out was because um, they ended up having too many censored values. And so uh, the results would have been not particularly reliable. So it was better to remove them. And that was work carried out with a geochemist and a, and a geologist. And uh, the geochemist has some 40 years experience in these kind of data. Well, what I mean is da uh, values below a detection limit. Uh, Essentially zero. Right? No, they aren't necessarily zero. They're just below detection limit. So they might uh, they, they, the uh, various elements you use have uh, different resolutions and they can go to a particular um, lower limit that they can still confidently name, yeah? which is above zero, but... It's a problem with the zeros, isn't it? Oh, zeros are, zeros are a massive problem, yeah? I mean, uh, so you have problems if you have zeros, yeah? And then you need to decide why they're missing. With these ones, with these ones, no. And with the manganese, phosphorus, and so on in the previous analysis, neither. And the reason why, why we threw, for example, out things like 
chlorine variables like chlorine is because chlorine wasn't consistently analyzed yeah in this case they always do an assay for everything but nevertheless they might end up saying that the method they've used for the uh, for the analysis is not sufficiently sensitive to give an exact reading for a particular element and that's why you have censored data and they're censored in that sense not necessarily uh, they they might actually uh, they might actually go ahead and simply fit a distribute uh, say they they assume that they take a beta distribution or something else and they draw values at random they might also uh, impute them from the surrounding data and from data with similar characteristics so uh, there's a whole lot of different techniques this whole thing about yeah, uh, the way chemists fix off the load yeah. is something that they have taught yeah. or more accurately misfought at a yeah. young age. Yeah. And it's one of the worst things that chemists do. Yeah. Just been considering at the moment for another project. It's absolutely horrific the way they say load and fix them. Therefore, you know nothing. Yeah. It's absolutely untrue. Yeah, no, that's true. But I mean, you need to treat it somehow. Yeah. Oh, I yeah, I mean the other thing, the 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 other common thing you do when you have this uh, below detection limit is that they take half the value, half the detection limit as a value. Yeah, mm -hmm. as a whole lot of different techniques that get used for that purpose. Yeah, it's a bit hard to see the difference between uh, below the detection limit and a zero. I mean, you're not detecting it, right? So... No, no, that's not true. No, 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 that's it. That's that's just it. That, that's much worse if it if it was if it was exactly zero uh, that's a completely different that's that's just as bad a problem in this setting yeah because i mean then uh, a lot of techniques break down <clears throat> yeah but the reason the way that it is sensitive is very much an artifact. Yeah. And as I said earlier, the way that chemists are taught from a very young age, they are usually by the time they deal with them, they're beyond novel. <laughs> well, I mean, but that happens in but but that happens in a lot of disciplines, yeah. I mean uh one. Yeah. I, I I mean Yeah. But Nicola, you see the problem you have here is you also have different sensitivity you also have different sensitivities. If you analyze if you were to be able to analyze the same data again now as you analyzed two years ago, the uh, analytical techniques sometimes have improved and you might actually get values uh, at a, at at a different level still yeah so i mean it's it's just one of the features of that data set and um carol ron and uh peter filzmoser have done a lot of work on on that imputation issue and there are lots of papers out on it so anyway but this the other interesting thing is you see the sampling isn't exactly unif isn't there's a big gap here that uh, where there are no samples that's native title. Yeah. And one of the uh, things that, uh, that, that was happening in that set was we were looking at, hmm, well, we've got all these variables now, what are we going to do with them? And one of my colleagues, uh, Eric Gronsky from the Geological Survey in Canada, he wanted to do some dimension reduction that also takes in um, the the spatial aspect because these data are clearly spatial. Yeah. So we used a method called minimum maximum autocorrelation factors, which was invented by Switzer and Green, Green from the CSIRO and Switzer from Stanford, which essentially takes first of all a, piece, a, a PCA of the data, then having done a PCA, you look at uh, increments, and that's spatial increments, so a, a variogram matrix at a particular lag spacing, for example, 
and you uh, apply an eigenvalue eigenvector composition decomposition to that with the idea that that way you denoise and you reduce the noise a bit and that was first used in a setting on um, um, satellite data in the very early in the in I think in the 90s sometime so what you end up with is factors that are instead of like a PCA strictly ordered by variability and maximum variability first and decreasing in variability this time the criterion is continuity so the better the continuity the, the lower the math index is. So you, math one has the best spatial continuity, math 10, 15, depending on how many variables you have, the worst. In this particular instance, you would have 50 math factors as well, but after about the first 10, you don't, you don't have much more than spatial noise. Um, so the first one is uh, applying the PCA. Yeah. The sec, the, then you scale, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the second rotation, that is the rotation that comes from the second uh, PCA, which is a PCA on the spatial increments, and that is that is the one that does the denoising work. In the case of Switzer and Green, what they actually did is they used an average of two directions to get this done because they had gridded data and so they used that. It, typically, you just use what is a good average separation distance for the incrementation. So and then we inter interpolated the various horizons and looked at some of the factors and Lo and behold, the geologist and the geochemist were very happy. The reason why they were happy was because some of the features that stand out in this data set, like this big block here, which is also in this one here, and in this one here, and in this one there, that actually ref uh, reflects the Yilgarn craton. Yeah? And likewise, this here, this here, and so on, more or less clearly gives you what is called the Aromanga Basin. And they spend, a, they spend a lot of time exploring these data and said, okay, and on this one, we can see the New England fold belt yeah? because it shows up in this diagram, and this diagram, and this diagram, and this diagram, which are the four, which are the two horizons times the two soil fractions. So each one represents one of these. And so, and the same with the next one, but uh, it, it then breaks down afterwards. By the time you get to factor seven or so, you don't see very much any longer. But what they then wanted to find out is whether or not, for example, given the features they saw in the previous slides, could they go ahead and use these geochemical analyses to infer something about crustal blocks in Australia? And the uh, map here at the bottom, apologies, it's a bit too small. That actually shows some of the crustal blocks. Uh, these are blocks that come about that the that were interpreted by the uh, by Geoscience Australia. And so the question was, can we do something with them? So what Eric did is he tagged, in other words, he 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 found given a particular location, the crustal block it would normally con, uh, correspond to from the map in the bottom. And then said, okay, I now do a linear discriminant analysis. I had nothing to do with that part at all. I did the math and the variography and these kind of things. And then having done the LDA, he got scores and, prob and probabilities of detection. And came up with posterior probabilities showing the likelihood of encountering a particular crustal block. Each one of these labels corresponds to one of these. And well, we had some 22 of them which had enough samples that it would make sense to try and do some geostats. Now these are essentially detection probabilities. So they add up to 100%. So you could either treat them also again as uh, compositionally, 
or you can treat them as soft indicators and do a soft indicator creaking over them, leaving one of them out in order to not get into trouble with um, a covariance matrix that has a zero eigenvalue. And so that is what we did. So we fitted a linear model of co-regionalization. In other words, a big fat variogram. Um, and then looked at the interpolated data in order to get a smooth image. And of course, you still have your 22 probabilities, which is still a bit 22 maps of probabilities. So it's some post-processing to come up with the most likely map. And that's the one here on the left. So this is the most likely crustal block. Something belongs to given um, the probabilities we saw on the previous slide. But then we could also look at misclassification probabilities and at uh, entropy. Blue in these is low, yellow is yellow and red tones are high. And um, these kind of approaches are actually used quite commonly when you try and analyze these geochemical survey data, because once you have all these variables, then you need to do something with them. Yeah? And one of the things that is very common is to see how can you best exploit them, typically together with other variables such as um, geophysics or seismic or something else, to infer something meaningful about the geology. And um, that is actually the study that first got me into that area. So I thought I'd throw it in. And need a whole lot of acknowledgements. First of all, Raymond Tolosana Delgado and Gerald and Hassan and Clint, who were students who were victimized in that they had they did studies on these topics. Clint Ward, in particular, supplied the 3D data set for study. And then Eric Gronsky and Patrice de Caritat for the geol survey data. And that's that. <laughs>